I'm Tom Zinnan. I work for UW Madison and UW Extension. Thanks again for coming tonight. Uh, the WAA folks aren't here, but this is a co-production with Wisconsin Alumni Association and the Biotech Center. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Now I get to grill Chris. Chris, where were you born? Indianapolis, Indiana. Indianapolis, Indiana. Does anything famous happen in Indianapolis? <laughs> Never mind. I think they run a race. They run a race. <laughs> uh, and did you go to high school there? I did. Where'd you go for undergrad? Southeast Missouri State University. And that is in? Cape Girardeau, Missouri. Which is almost Ooh. down to the boot heel, but not quite. And where'd you go for your advanced degrees? I was a PhD student here. Where? Which here at here? UW Madison. In this Sean, building with, here? Uh, no, oh, we're in Bach Labs with okay. Sean Carroll. That's why I didn't know you. Sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> but hey, you gotta love a building name for a type of beer. <laughs> Hard crowd, okay. <laughs> so you were Sean Carroll, the physicist? Yes, the physicist. <laughs> so there's two Sean Carrolls in the Torius hey. One's at UCLA, I think. Uh, U Chicago, I think. Maybe he's moved. If only I had a phone where I could look it up. Okay, Sean Carroll, and then you went to cool places to postdoc? Uh, I was a postdoc with Mark Johnston at Washington University in St. Louis and the University of Colorado School of Medicine. Good. Uh, I think this is some of the most interesting research for those of us in Wisconsin in a long time. It's really, really cool stuff to see what you've been doing the last few years since you arrived here as a professor, and I'm looking forward to hearing about it. And afterwards, we will take some question and answers. We will limit question and answers to two minutes <laughs> total. All right, I'm just kidding. Uh, and then we will adjourn and go to the terrace and enjoy some bucolic gumutlakite with a brew and a draft. Uh, tonight, Chris is gonna talk about beer biofuels and beyond, yeast biodiversity, in the age of genomics, please join me in welcoming Chris Hittinger to Winter. Thank you. All right, uh, I think my mic's working. Thank you, Tom, for that uh, uh, generous introduction, and thank you all for that uh, warm welcome. Um, the only part of the introduction that I can absolutely guarantee uh, I will live up to is that we can have a beer on the terraces later. So, uh, so I'll uh, I'll go with you and and have some fun. Um, so back before Adam Cole was a, a respectable science journalist and producer for, at NPR's Science Desk, he used to write uh, silly science songs like this one. And I'm going to start out In today's the topic. year of our Lord, 1811, on March the 17th day, the Feast of St. Patrick, I will raise up a beer, and I'll raise up a cheer. For Saccharomyces Cerevisiae. <laughs> yes, here's the brewer's yeast, that humblest of all beasts, producing carbon gas, producing acetaldehyde. But my friends, that isn't all. It makes ethyl alcohol. Yes, that is what the yeast excretes, and that's what we apply. Oh, anaerobic isolation, alcoholic fermentation, and ABH oxidation. Give me a beer. All right, so if we unpack uh, what Adam Cole is telling us, there's actually quite a bit of science in there. And I didn't notice anybody lip syncing along, but maybe you've heard that a, a couple of years uh, before. Maybe you were soaking in all the, all the biochemistry. But uh, it's, it's actually a pretty accurate song. I'll note this is, that's actually the second version. There were a few mistakes in the first version. And you know, it's people like you that get out there and correct science journalists when they, uh, when they get some of the details wrong. But, but it, you know, in all seriousness, um, we owe uh, thanks, uh, not just for, for wine and bread, uh, but also for beer to, to that, uh, that organism, that Saccharomyces cerevisiae. We usually abbreviate it S. cerevisiae. Uh, but Saccharomyces cerevisiae is, is a Latin word, as all species names have to be. And literally, it translates into sugar fungus of the beer. So a pretty apt name for the thing that gives us beer. 
So we raise up a beer and a cheer, and it's here's to brewer's yeast, that humblest of all beasts. Now, I, I think many of you are probably good enough at taxonomy identification to know that you know, beast would usually be an animal, and so we're maybe stretching things a little bit, but there's actually truth even in that, because if we look at the broader tree of life, uh, yeasts are eukaryotes. So they have a nucleus, they're not bacteria, Bacteria are one-celled organisms without a nucleus. Eukaryotes are two different uh, organisms that came together, a bacteria and an archaea, to, to make an organism with a eukaryote. But not only that, they're actually one-celled fungi that don't produce fruiting bodies. And fungi are actually more closely related to animals than they are to plants. Because the thing that we share with them is that is basically that we're lazy. We take all the hard work that plants do, fixing energy from the sun and locking it up in carbon, and we heterotrophs just come along and, and consume it all. Uh, we do it by ingesting food into our bodies, whereas fungi do it by injecting their bodies into the, into the food. So even in there, he's you know getting us in the right direction. If we look at the fungal kingdom, we can see actually that the yeast life style of uh, uh, having uh, being a one-celled fungus instead of a multicellular fungus has actually evolved multiple times within the uh, uh, kingdom fungi. Uh, and most of them are actually this group of, of ascomycetes. But there's actually a few basidiomycetes. So there's a few types of yeasts that are actually more closely related to mushrooms um, than, than they are to molds or, or other yeasts. So uh, then... Uh, uh, Adam Cole starts to go on and gets a little more into the, the chemistry and, 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 and some perspectives of the more interesting parts. But he starts out by focusing on one of the things that really we th what we think about when we think about yeasts is what they can do for us, what they produce, right? Um, so he's talking about you know, producing, producing these, these chemicals. And generally, all the, the chemicals that, that we think of fungi producing and yeasts in particular uh, tend to be carbon products. And he focuses in on a, a couple ones. Uh, the, the, the ones he focuses on are uh, the, the first step of fermentation is actually uh, production of carbon gas. That's what makes beer fizzy, right? That, uh, it's also what makes soda fizzy. Um, and then he goes through an intermediate acetaldehyde uh, that actually is, is the product directly before ethanol. So there's actually not a lot of ethanol in, or sorry, a lot of acetaldehyde in beer, but it gets uh, produced as an intermediate. And then what we're looking for are these carbon products, ethanol and uh, carbon dioxide. And of course, you know, it's a song, so we can celebrate some products more than others. So obviously, yeah, yes, that's, that's what the yeast excretes. That's what we imbibe. So we're, we're really after this one. Although, you know, I think if you've ever had a flat beer, I think you can appreciate how important that carbon dioxide is to, to the flavor and, and the taste too. So he then goes in to uh, focusing on a couple other parts here. Again, we've, I've already alluded to the fact that this is a fermentation process. So we talk about uh, alcoholic fermentation, and so we're actually, uh, this is a process that isn't involving, uh, uh, isn't involving oxygen, it's, it's, it's producing ethanol and carbon dioxide. It's doing that from carbon sources, and in the case of yeast, uh, that's usually some kind of sugar. Uh, and the simplest kind of sugar, in fact, the most common sugar on the planet is actually glucose. That's basically, uh, that's what gets pumped through our bloodstream. That's the only kind of uh, sugar that's used by uh, the, the brain to fuel life. And so uh, glucose is really, it's so central to metabolism, in fact, that the, the term for going down to the point where you can make that decision of what you make is called glycolysis, breaking glucose apart, right? Um, so at that point of choosing uh, what you're going to do with it, it really depends on whether you have oxygen available. And so if oxygen um, is not available, you have to ferment and you have to go ahead and uh, uh, make something like ethanol and carbon dioxide. And that's because you generate a lot of NADH during glycolysis and you have to do something to get that NAD back. You remember that loop when he was singing? Uh, about NADH, you have to get it back so that you can keep running glycolysis. And fermentation is sort of your last ditch attempt to get that back. How many people have ever gotten a cramp while exercising? Okay, so you've experienced exactly this, this loop here. We don't make ethanol and put it into our bloodstream. That might uh, make people more likely to exercise, I suppose. Um, <laughs> instead, we make a, 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 a three carbon version called lactate. And so that's our, when, when we don't have enough oxygen to fuel our muscles, we're trying to keep glycolysis going and we start dumping those electrons from NADH 
uh, on, on to lactate in order to get it to go. So the reason Cerevisiae is actually such a good fermenter is not just because we can put it in anaerobic isolation and get it to ferment, it actually chooses to do it. If, if glucose levels are high enough, even if you give it oxygen, it doesn't even bother to look at it. It just says, I'm gonna ferment because that's what, I, that's what I'm good at. But of course, our cells, our organisms, most organisms, and indeed most yeasts actually do the sensible thing, which is if oxygen is available, they'll use that oxygen as that final electron acceptor to go ahead and fully oxidize things, right? And so instead of getting ethanol then, you get water and more carbon dioxide. And that's what most of your cells are doing right now is, is fully oxidizing every molecule of glucose. And you're actually getting 10 to 20 times more energy by doing that than uh, something like Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And that's why ethanol still has energy in it. That's why it's a fuel. Okay, so we've talked about glucose as the basis of uh, of glycolysis as the basis of fueling life. Uh, but it's actually not the main basis of making beer. So when we make beer, we do it from malt extract uh, that brewers call wort, W-O-R-T. Um, and this is a, a created by uh, uh, taking barley, uh, or in, in some cases, another grain. Uh, but uh, in, in most traditional cases, it's barley. And you start to germinate the barley and that they take those long chain polysaccharides uh, and start to chop it down uh, into its constituent molecules. And so some of that gets chopped all the way down to glucose, but you actually end up with most of the sugar and most of the energy is actually locked up in maltose or maltotriose, and that's why it's called malt extract. Um, and so this is just two glucose molecules that are still hooked together, and so it hasn't been broken down all the way, and they happen to be linked by a particular bond, a 1,4-alpha linkage. Uh, and then maltotriose is just three of them hooked together. And so if you look, the main sugars are actually maltose, maltotriose is in second, and then glucose is, is down in third. And that composes most of the sugar in that wort that breweries use to make beer. Okay, so people have brewed beer for thousands of years. There's archeological records of it in China and Egypt. Um, and probably what people have been using for most of the history is some strain of Saccharomyces cerevisiae making what we would consider an ale type beer. Um, and so uh, I've, I've listed a few types of ale beers here. Uh, they sometimes have ale in their name. They're often British style beers is, is, is what we would tend to associate that with in America. So if you like an IPA or a pale ale, um, porter, a stout, you're probably drinking uh, an ale. A lot, of, if you're thinking right now of a small microbrewery beer that is your, your favorite, and it doesn't specify that it's a lager, it's probably an ale. These tend to be unfiltered or minimally filtered, and they tend to be brewed at warmer temperatures, basically Mediterranean room temperature, and that's probably why Cerevisiae was the organism domesticated to do this. And indeed, this is a part of why uh, uh, it's uh, much cheaper to produce ales because you don't have to have refrigeration and you can just do it at sort of whatever room temperature there is. But there's another style of beer out there and that style of beer is called uh, lager. And so this was a, a cold fermentation process invented in the 15th century in Bavaria. And then as Germans went around the world in the 19th century, they took it uh, all over the world, including to Wisconsin, where, where we had a, a strong German heritage. And you can see in the names of the styles of, um, of beer that a lot of these have a, a pretty uh, a German uh, characteristic. And I hadn't actually made the connection, but yes, I was in Bach Labs, and so there's probably even a deep connection to my uh, academic, uh, academic heritage, as, as, as Tom uh, noted. And so actually, if you were thinking about your favorite, because of Wisconsin's uh, strong tradition, you may have actually been thinking of a micro brewed beer in Wisconsin uh, that, is a, that is a lager beer. We actually have a number of great, uh, nice uh, lagers here brewed uh, in Wisconsin from, from some of the smaller breweries. But if you're thinking of one of those big macro, bre macro breers out there, you're also probably thinking of a lager. And 90, over 90% 90 of the beer market, over a quarter trillion dollars in the US annually is from lager beer sales. And Tom either has a question or he's gonna take advantage of the fact we're not taping and and ask a question. And ask a question, sure. Well, you had me in scotch. What is that? Is that just good? Scotch, yeah. scotch ale. Okay. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, although, although to be fair, if, if you are interested in distilling, uh, di di distilling you usually do start with making a, basically a beer first and then distilling it. Um, so 
Um, I wouldn't add the hops in that case, but uh, you know. So lagering, because it's done at this cold temperature, this you know 40 to 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Indeed, lagering actually means to store. So you do a, a relatively cold fermentation, and then you store it actually near the edge of freezing uh, for for several weeks. Um, and that gives you a really, uh, the combination of cold fermentation and cold storage gives you a, a nice, clear product uh, and, and, a, and a crisp taste, um, and, and many people prefer that. Um, okay, so, so let's take a survey. How many people here prefer ales? <coughs> okay, so, so the, these are the microbrew snobs. How many, <laughs> how many people prefer lagers? Okay, it, 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 this is a Wisconsin audience. It's about split. How many people prefer free beer? <laughs> okay, that was a hundred percent. So some people voted twice. Um, but, um, we have two hands. Yeah, you have two hands. Fair enough. Okay, so um, so it turns out that the story of how lager beer is made is is actually a really fascinating biological story. It turns out that it's actually brewed with a hybrid of a cerevisiae ale yeast, these historical yeasts that were domesticated for making ales and some other species. And it turns out that we didn't actually know what that other species was. We knew it, there was out there, that it was something, until um, right when I arrived here as a new assistant professor in 2011, uh, we published with our uh, Argentinian collaborator, Diego Libkin, the discovery of that missing species. And that missing species turns out uh, to be called Saccharomyces eubayanus, or, or the true bayanus, the true origin of, of, of beer. Um, and so what I'm showing here is that you can see that all of these different species of yeasts actually are associated with natural environments. Uh, in fact, when we isolate them, we're mostly getting them off of soil or bark or, or, or some other place and then enriching them to, to get them. Um, but there are a few lineages of Saccharomyces cerevisiae that have been domesticated. One lineage has been domesticated for wine production, one lineage for sake production, one lineage for bread production, uh, one or two lineages for ale production. And so we think it's one of those lineages that crossed with this wild yeast that was originally isolated, first discovered in South America, where it seems to be very, very prevalent, down in Patagonia, where it's nice and cold. Uh, and we've actually now isolated uh, strains from the Northern Hemisphere, including right here in Wisconsin, although they're very, very rare. So what we think happened is you have a, a good, nice uh, ale strain that's domesticated that ferments wort very well, makes beer, uh, hybridizing with this cold tolerant species that you now get something in between a cold tolerant brewing strain. I have a, a yeah. question. What surprised me of what you said is the, the domestication of cerveza, or how you pronounce that? Cerveza, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I understand the domestication of dogs and cats and mm -hmm. stuff, but domesticating you had not yeah well so uh, so I think that that's uh, a fairly new research process and it uh, we don't work uh, in our lab so much on the domestication of ale strains but there have been studies in the last year or so um, uh, from a couple labs in Europe and some of the key things seem to be loss of sex um, and also the <laughs> loss of uh, genes involved in, in some of the aromatic uh, 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 enzymes that, that process uh, chemicals into air, aromatic compounds that people tend to, to dislike, um, uh, especially the you know clovey vice beers. Um, so there's a gene called Pad one and FDC1 that are involved in that. So that's what, that's what I say when I mean domestication. The other thing I mean is that it's a particular sub-lineage of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, not a random strain of cerevisiae. If we got a random strain of cerevisiae from the dirt, which you can find, it would not necessarily do a good job of making beer. And it, and it would have those funky flavors, and it also would not be adapted to using maltose and maltotriose as aggressively as the domesticated strains. So when we talk about a strain, we're just talking about an individual. Basically, like all of us are homo sapiens, right? We're all a species, but each of us is our own individual. And so when we talk about a strain, it's a strain that's got its own particular set of genetic characteristics. So if we look at how different all of the species of Saccharomyces are, there are seven of them that are known, and we look at their DNA, we can actually see that there's quite a lot of genetic diversity. Um, and, and so here, here's our, our, our chancellor representing Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, the nearest outgroup uh, is already at about human uh, mouse level of, of uh, sequence divergence. And if we go all the way out to uh, Eubayanus, that cross to make lager is actually about a human chicken level cross. Uh, so yeasts are not nearly as discerning as you and I are. Um, you can get that cross. And because you're just 
repitching it, it, it's produ reproducing asexually. And so the fact that it's sterile, like a mule, doesn't really matter um, because we just keep uh, pushing it and passaging it asexually. If we tried to push it through and force it uh, to engage in sexual reproduction, then it would be stuck because, you know, human, bird, that's pretty far apart. Okay, so, so logger production is, is basically this. It's that process I showed you for beer production. It's just now, it's an interspecies hybrid. It's got complete genomes, mostly complete, from two species, Cervicea and Eubanus, and it's happening in the cold. So uh, a couple uh, uh, of my lab members, uh, two postdocs, uh, Dr. Bill Alexander and Dr. Uh, David Paris, developed a new technique to make synthetic logger strains. In fact, we... Uh, this actually gets around some, some pesky things that would prevent crossing of industrial strains, but we think we can take any industrial strain of ale from any brewery and cross it to our wild strains of Ubanus, including those from Wisconsin, and we can make a synthetic lager strain, and that allows us to study what's being contributed by what parent. Uh, and because in my lab we mostly work in, you know, like 20 microliters or 100 microliters at a time, uh, we have to work with uh, Jim Steele's lab over in food science where they can actually make beer. On, on an appropriate scale. And that's over in Babcock. Uh, and you, I think you can see it, uh, see their uh, 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 setup uh, even when you're on the cheese tour. Um, so first I'll start out with maltose. It turns out that at cold temperature, you actually get Eubayanus does reasonably well on maltose. Cerevisiae, of course, does reasonably well on maltose. But where you really start to see differences between the parents and the hybrid is on maltotrios. And that's because every strain of Eubayanus that anyone has looked at so far cannot touch maltotrios. And so there's the starting point. You can see the Eubayanus parent doesn't touch it at all. Cerevisiae starts, it does okay, but it's getting slowed down by that cold temperature. Even at 10 degrees Celsius, it's still uh, much colder than that warm adapted uh, species likes. And so if you combine the two genomes, what you get now is the cold tolerance of Eubayanus combines with the good fermentation properties of Cerevisiae, and you can actually see the, cerevis, uh, the, the synthetic hybrid actually outperforms uh, uh, either parent for maltotrios production. And you actually get, uh, get pretty good ethanol yield in the final uh, beer. Okay, so that's an example of, you know, strains that we made can actually be used to make beer. Uh, it's drinkable. Um, you know, maybe one day it'll be at the Union. Um, we can also study the genome sequences. Now that we have the parent species, we can actually look and we can sequence the genome of logger strains. So this is just the genome of one logger strain. And what we've done is we've plotted the number of times we see each part of the genome on the <laughs> y-axis. And then on the x-axis, we've put each of those seven species that I showed you. And what you can see pretty easily is that this logger strain doesn't have any representatives from those guys in the middle, but it's got lots of genes from Cerevisiae and lots of genes from Eubanus. So the story I told you is true. I didn't just make it up. <laughs> and we can actually normalize that to read coverage, and we can actually now tell you how many chromosomes there are for, for each part of the genome. And so those dips down there, those one chromosome, this is two chromosomes, three chromosomes, four chromosomes, and we can do the same for Eubanus. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, this, these types of plots are developed by a graduate student, Quinn Langdon. Uh, she calls them uh, spider plots, which, which is a, a, a taxonomic joke. Um, does anybody get it? Okay, if I have to explain it, it's not funny. <laughs> But we can look at these types of strains, and now we can look at the parents, and you see the parents are our constant copy number. And what that tells us is that logger yeasts are more than just putting the two genomes together, right? You've got uh, several types of genetic events that are actually changing the copy number uh, between chromosomes, you know, and, and these are things like gene conversion, translocation, chromosomal non-disjunction, and that's how you get from having um, an even copy number to different copy numbers. And we can look at different logger strains, and so here are three examples of the same uh, general type of logger strain called uh, Froberg logger strain. And that's just named for the uh, region of Central Europe that it comes from. Um, and you can see that they're pretty similar in that they're about 50-50, but you can see there are actually some differences between each of those three strains. These, this Froberg lineage is the main type that's still used to make lager beer today. So this is what, if you've been drinking lager beer, you're drinking something made by a strain that looks something like one of those. There's another type of uh, uh, lager brewing strain called the Saas lineage, 
that was actually really popular at the turn of the century. It's not used so much anymore because it requires a colder fermentation temperature, which means it takes longer and time is money, right? Um, so, but you can see that they have more copies of the Eubayanus genome and less copies of the Cerevisiae genome. But it gets even cooler than that, because you know, I wouldn't have made this spider plot if we could just focus on those two. But if we look at other types of beers out there, we start to see more complexity. So how many people like uh, uh, Chime or Trappist or Belgian styles of beers? Three or four suckers in the audience? <laughs> One of them is my wife, so I guess that's okay. Um, <laughs> So these actually are often hybrids of cerevisiae in another species called Cudrevzevi, and you can see much the same process that is going on with this difference uh, in copy number. Then if we look at champagnes and ciders, we often get contributions from uh, Eubayanus and its sister species, Uvarum. Uh, some of these also have contributions from, uh, little bits of contributions from Cerevisiae and Cudrevzevi, and then there's a few cider strains and champagne strains that are actually true four-way hybrids. Um, and so you can actually see, uh, this is a, a good example here, where you can actually see bits of, of, of all four genomes popping up. So we've talked a bit about the, the real basics of how, uh, what's going into fermented beverages. We've talked about glucose, we've talked about maltose and maltotriose, and we've talked about the fizzy stuff and the, the, and the, the ethanol. But there's other things that are, there's, there's more than just uh, ethanol, uh, otherwise we could just, you know, carbonate uh, vodka, right? Um, so there's more to the flavor profile, and those tend to be some of those other compounds, uh, things like uh, esters, uh, even isobutanol is actually uh, uh, pretty prevalent in a lot of, of uh, uh, lager beers and um, is also contributes to the flavor profile. Uh, glycerol is one of the major contributors to mouthfeel in wine. And, and sometimes it's present. And so these are other carbon products, other things that, that yeast can do. And they can also take other, uh, other inputs, especially if you're making uh, some, you know, a, a cider or, or, or something where it's not a grain, you know, you're gonna have sucrose and fructose and maybe even some galactose, um, you know, other types of monosaccharides or disaccharides. So, so it's, it's a bit more complex. Now I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and talk about uh, some of the similarities between brewing and the biofuel industry. And what you're gonna see is that it's actually the same basic goals. We're trying to get them to eat something and make something. Right, and so the main sugar is the same, glucose, but there's also other sugars at play. Um, things like xylose is actually the second most abundant sugar in plant material, and so if you're trying to make a fuel that doesn't compete with the food source and instead consumes agricultural waste products or the woody parts of plants, you need to be able to consume xylose. Um, cellobios is really interesting because it's actually almost exactly like maltose, it's just the beta linkage instead of the alpha linkage. So it's, it's a two, another two carbon, uh, and, uh, sorry, another two uh, gl glucose molecule. And then things that we think of as fuels are, are ethanol. If you're making it from cellulosic sources, it's, it's, it's renewable and has a, a, a net benefit on sustainability. And then there are advanced biofuels like isobutanol, which is a flavor compound in beer and wine production, is actually a, a great candidate for a next generation biofuel. And then there are also lipids, which would be a great candidate for biodiesel lipids and fatty acids. So it turns out that Cerevisiae and its close relatives have done a great job of making uh, beer and other fermented beverages for us, but they don't necessarily do any of this stuff right out of the gate. So one of the things that we started in my lab was part to address this issue of how are we going to get yeasts that use diverse things and make diverse things, but also how are we going to get young uh, freshmen excited about doing real science for the first time. And so we developed the Yeast Exploration and Analysis Science Team, which is maybe the worst acronym ever, just yeast. Um, we more affectionately call it the, the Wild Yeast Program. And it turns out you can send early stage scientists just out to dig into, dig into the dirt, and then they come back and they, to the lab and they give the, the soil or, or bark or whatever they have, lots of sugar, and then antibiotics to inhibit the bacteria, and then they can go isolate individual yeast Strains, and then they can identify them using modern molecular genetic techniques and bioinformatic techniques. 
And it turns out they can actually, because this goes from really concrete digging in the soil, you know, stuff anybody can do. In fact, there's a citizen science program, and you can dig in the soil and send us samples if you want. Um, up to more abstract stuff where they're sitting at a computer interpreting genetic data. Um, it, get, it gets progressively harder as they go, and, and usually in about a semester or so, uh, good students are here, and then they can start to design their own advanced projects. Uh, so we've got uh, yeasts now from all over the U.S. We've uh, isolated over 2,000 new strains in this way, uh, and, and then actually quite a few more in, in other ways, and, and we're uh, preparing a full-scale survey. About 25% of the collection was published in 2015. And of course, we get exciting, interesting things. Saccharomyces always excites us. Um, but I think maybe more, su maybe more surprising or more interesting is actually we get things that are completely new to science altogether. And so, if you remember, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is sugar fungus of the beer. And so, when you discover a new species, you get to, to name it. And unfortunately, you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae was named 150 years ago, and people had a pretty good idea what it did. did. But now, most yeast species, by the time somebody discovered it, you know almost nothing about it except for its little snippet of DNA. And so, taxonomists have fallen into this habit of naming species for each other, you know, their favorite other taxonomist, and, and it gets pretty boring uh, because it makes all the names indecipherable. So we, um, we've done a little bit of that because you know, we're, we're serious academics. Um, but we've also done some fun things. And so here's Bucky's yeast, Blastobotrys buckinghamii. Uh, Buckingham is, uh, Buckingham U. Badger is Bucky's uh, uh, legal, full, full legal name, and then Buckinghamii just means you know, in honor of of Buckingham, and so, and there's uh, Bucky coming to meet his yeast, which, which I'm holding up right there for us. And then, uh, published just this month here, uh, we actually have Yamatozyna laniorum, uh, which laniorum literally translates to uh, uh, pertaining to butchers, and that's named for the hardworking people of the meatpacking industry of Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, uh, better known as the Packers, and here you can see a modern day. Uh, a modern day packer. Um, so, and then as I said, you know, we've, we've, we've named things serious things too, and actually we think we have dozens of more species uh, to describe. But that really just highlights the, that we're just scratching the surface of yeast biodiversity. And so we've embarked on an ambitious project actually to completely describe the known yeast biodiversity partially so that we can better interpret the unknown use biodiversity, but also so that we can study evolutionary patterns and how different organisms are using different carbon sources, how they're making different products. And so this is the first project where uh, anybody's trying to sequence uh, every genome of a known, uh, uh, or, sorry, every genome of uh, eukaryotic subphylum. So this, the, this is focusing on just one of these uh, stems of yeasts. It happens to be the, the one that has the most species, so there are over a thousand species of Saccharomycotina. And so we're sort of dragging biodiversity and taxonomy into the 21st century, and we have a, a great longtime collaborator, uh, uh, Cleet Kurtzman <coughs> down at the, the USDA office uh, in Peoria, uh, Illinois, um, which is unfortunately slated for closure in the new federal budget. Um, so I, I think, you know, that's something we all need to consider seriously, whether that's a decision uh, that, you know, we should be making. But he is the world's leading taxonomist and has been for 50 years. And he's collected every species uh, of yeast known in these little glass vials that are smaller than your pinky finger. And every one of them has been painstakingly filed open, cracked open uh, at, by this uh, gentleman here, Jeremy de Virgilio. Uh, sorry, I can't say his name right. De Virgilio. Um, and you can see uh, he's given us a thumbs up either because he just cut himself on one of those glass tubes or because things are going really well today. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, 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 Amanda Holfaker, our lab manager, has developed a database and a barcoding system. So now these are actually frozen in glycerol in our freezers here at UW. Um, and are uh, in a nice uh, high throughput format. And that allows us to do uh, whole genome sequencing and high throughput phenotyping where we, uh, and so we do a whole genome sequencing uh, on the Illumina platform, two by 250 reads for those of you aficionados. And Dana Apolente has been the main person in charge of that as well as doing high throughput uh, uh, growth curves. We can do up to 5,000 growth curves at once when the, when the uh, stacker and plate reader are working, which is not always, um, 
And then uh, we compare the phenotypes and genomes, uh, and the goal is to understand how 500 million years of evolution has played out, uh, uh, what the evolutionary processes are, and then also what of that can be used by people either to make better beer or to make better biofuels. And it gets a little washed out here, but I'm going to show you this is the third waypoint. This is complete genomes for 332 species. So you can all read your favorite uh, yeast species off that tree. Remember, they're all named for dead taxonomists, so don't, don't, so I actually strip the names off. Um, but you can see, uh, to the extent the color hasn't been washed off, this is actually the family level classification. And the fact that there's a big solid blue here, you know, actually, and, and only a few cases where this color is missing tells you actually that the taxonomist didn't do a bad job of telling you, of, of determining who was related to whom, even without genomes. There are a few cases where the genomes really help uh, get, figure out who's related to whom. Okay, so to orient you, the genus Saccharomyces is right here, this seven species, and so if you were awed by the human chicken uh, level sequence divergence, you know, once you go out to the 500 million year mark, you know, we have there's more genetic diversity here than there is in all animals. If there's one other yeast you knew of before you got here, it's probably Canada albicans. This is what causes yeast infections or thrush in people. Uh, it's a normal part of our microbiota, but when it gets out of control, that's when you get a yeast infection. Uh, this is about where Bucky's yeast is. That's about where the, the, the Packer's yeast is. Um, and then there are a couple other groups that are really of, in, of, of great biofuel interest. Remember xylose, that xylose fermenting yeasts belong to this part of the tree, and so they're quite distant from Saccharomyces. Saccharomyces doesn't, doesn't touch his stuff, but these guys, some of these guys out here do. And then there are oleaginous yeasts, or oily yeasts, and these guys can produce, in some cases, over half of their dry weight in lipid bodies as, as oil. Uh, and so they make a potentially a great uh, target for, for making biodiesel fuels. Uh, and then there's one other case that, that deserves special mention, and this is a case of a uh, uh, genus that evolved uh, quite good fermentation capabilities called Britannomyces. Anybody heard of Britannomyces or Decora? Couple beer aficionados. How many people have heard of sour beers? The more sour beers are, all, are kind of a, often a community, but Brett is a part of that community. Uh, and then there are also some beers that are made pure, uh, purely with Britannomyces. It independently evolved an aggressive fermentation lifestyle, and it's way out on this, this part of the tree. It's probably 250 million years divergent from Saccharomyces. Okay, so if we strip out the distances so that we can just focus on the patterns, um, we get what's called a cladogram. And so here, well, if it weren't washed out, um, you could actually see this, you know, a branching pattern there that says who's related to who, who's sister to whom. Um, there's the Saccharomyces. But what we really want to do is start to layer phenotypes on. And this work is really just beginning, but I'm going to focus on one case uh, called, uh, for that sugar that we mentioned earlier, the uh, galactose sugar. And we can look and see what organisms can use galactose and what can't. And so if it's green, they can use galactose. If there's an empty green box, um, they can't use galactose. And then we can look at whether they have their three genes <coughs> encoding three enzymes that are required to use galactose. And what we can see is that they almost line up perfectly. So in focusing on the Saccharomyces, there's a case of a loss of both the genes and the phenotype. And if you go around the tree, you can see in most of the cases, the genome is highly predictive of what the phenotype is going to be. So the other thing we can do be is because yeasts don't engage in a lot of horizontal gene transfer like bacteria do, we can count evolutionary events. And so if we do that, we would infer that over these 500 billion years, we have at least 28 independent losses of galactose metabolism. So this is an evolutionary event that has repeated itself over and over and over again in yeast evolution. And we can do this with a lot of different ones. This is just, this is just one uh, sugar we're, uh, that's particularly illustrative. Okay, so galactose is not a major component for uh, cellulosic biofuels, but I want to shift gears to focus the last part of my talk on the challenge of cellulosic biofuels. And this is something we work on with our uh, colleagues and collaborators in, in the DOE Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center. Um, and so the goal of uh, the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center is to sustainably produce uh, biofuels uh, from plant mass. And so the process is, is simply we're going after the, the, the woody 
uh, parts of plants, not the food parts of plants, um, and even possibly dedicated energy crops. They get taken apart by some combination of chemicals and heat and enzymes. And then you get a hydrolysate that contains uh, sugars and um, sugars and other things, and you try to make a fuel out of it. And that hydrolysate is actually, you can think of that as basically the wort of biofuels, right? So, you know, this is the, this is the, the wort, the malt extract that we're going to try to make fuel out of. And so if we look at what's in that wort, we see it's actually a bit more challenging, because instead of just having maltose and maltotriose and glucose to deal with, we, we have lots of glucose, because plant cell wall is made mainly of glucose. But we see there's also uh, got a lot of that, that pesky xylose in it. And then there's also the part that gives plants rigidity, the lignin parts. And unfortunately, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, our champion fermenter, has exactly these reactions here. It loves glucose, it completely ignores xylose, doesn't touch the stuff, and it's getting poisoned by these aromatic compounds such as ferulic acid, ferulolamide, cumeric acid. Um, and so these are, just, these are phenylalanine derivatives, they're aromatic, and they're just toxic as all get out. Okay, so we can take yeast biodiversity to the rescue, and so these are a, a couple of the uh, other labs involved, Trey Sato's labs and Audrey Gash's lab in particular. Uh, we all work together as, as part of the, yeast, uh, the GLBRC yeast team. So we can take genes from one of those xylose fermenters I told you about in that part of the tree. Right? We'll take genes from that and put it in the service here, and you can actually get it to use xylose a little bit. So here we're taking a, a nice stress tolerant biofuel strain of cerevisiae, and we can get it to ferment xylose with a little bit of engineering and a little bit of adaptive evolution. So one of the things that we've done recently now is ask, what can we do about, about this problem here? And so we screened our collection of Saccharomyces, and we found a strain of a, a very understudied species called Saccharomyces macatiae that turns out to tolerate these toxins better than uh, any of the cerevisiae strains. And by simply hybridizing it, um, we, and then going through adaptive evolution, we can preserve this xylose fermentation ability while also <coughs> preserving that lignin tolerance, that tolerance to, to all of these toxins. And so, once we did this hybridization and then we did adaptive evolution for 50 generations, we wanted to look at what those genomes looked like. And in fact, I told you a little lie of omission earlier when I told you that all of these were strains and fermented beverages. This one is actually one of those evolved biofuel strains, and you can see it's evolving the same sort of copy number differences and looks very much like those uh, Chimay and Trappist. And so, Here's an example of strains that are now being synthetically made and adapted and are undergoing those same genetic processes of chromosomal amplification and loss as they adapt to become better biofuel producers. And so hopefully I've convinced you that there are uh, parallel processes here that go into making beer and biofuels. It's which one is used for beer and which one is used for biofuels uh, is a bit different, but there's substantial similarities. Glucose is central to everything. And then, you know, as I mentioned, cellobios and maltose are, are, are just different linkages. They're both the same thing. Some of the fuels are the same, like ethanol, and then some things like isobutanol are a flavor in one context and a fuel in the other. But the, prob the process and the, what yeasts can do for us in the future is the same. They can take those hard-won carbon molecules those sugars that plants have painstakingly fixed with energy from the sun and process them into a product that's useful or a fuel that we can use to untap the energy that remains. So the big picture take homes are that yeasts are diverse. I told you about how some like it hot and some like it cold. <coughs> some sweat when the heat is on. No, that's, that's something else. But, um, uh, and you know, so it's this difference of temperature profiles is what is giving us a unique uh, hybrid species that makes lager beer because it's a cold ferment fermentation process. Yeasts consume different carbon sources. Not everybody is good at doing everything. Some yeasts are better at, at consuming one thing than another, and we, in a lot of cases, understand the genetic basis of that. In a lot of cases, we still have work to do. The same thing can be said on that, the product side. Uh, they can make different products. Um, and in some cases we understand the genetic basis and others we don't. 
Okay, and then obviously some of those products are, are tasty to humans. So um, I, I see we're about split on, on ale and lager fans in the, uh, in the crowd and, and then a, a very small minority party for, for the Belgian beers. Um, and we'll get to enjoy that later on the terraces. Some of these products are useful to humanity and I think in particular advanced biofuels are gonna be uh, uh, useful for humanity. And then I think a lot of those uses have yet to be discovered. There are things coming out of the Y1000 Plus project, uh, the first time we've looked at an entire subphylum of eukaryotes that I would have said were impossible a year ago. Um, and I think there's gonna be some exciting surprises uh, that come out. And that's because genomics is really fueling these new discoveries in biodiversity. When we understand the genetic basis of traits, such as in the case of xylose metabolism, that's when we can take genes out for one organism, put them into another, and get it to do something we need. Um, and that's what enables, we can also use either hybridization, where we cross entire strains together, or individual genes to get strains to do what we want. So I wanna thank the, the people who actually did the work. Uh, this, is, this is my uh, uh, lab, uh, taken right, right outside there. Uh, in particular, I want to take, uh, thank uh, uh, Drs. Uh, David Paris and, and Bill Alexander, who, who developed that uh, new mechanism for engineering synthetic logger strains, uh, Dana Apolente and Jacek Kumanek, um, and Amanda Holfaker, uh, and our collaborators at Vanderbilt and USDA for, for their involvement in the Y1000 Plus project. Uh, Emily Baker and, and, and Quinn Langdon did a lot of the work on the uh, Saccharomyces eubanus diversity. Um, uh, uh, Ryan Moriarty has, has helped out with a number of projects. Uh, the uh, uh, Bucky's yeast was uh, discovered by Amanda Holfaker and Kayla Sylvester, and uh, the Packer's yeast was discovered by Max Hassa, who is actually from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and worked in a sausage factory. So he really <laughs> had to um, uh, work on that. And then we have a whole cadre of, of undergraduates and mentors who've contributed to the wild yeast program over the years. You can go to that link if you want to submit uh, citizen science samples and help us find new yeasts. But I'll take questions. But as Tom says, keep them short or we won't be drinking beer anytime soon. <laughs> Mm. Uh, or maybe even more to uh, deal with the lignin part of the problem. To deal with the lignin part. Yeah, and in fact, in nature, um, you know, if you've ever seen a rotting log, it's got shelf fungi and mushrooms and, 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 and filamentous fungi really go into town on that. And so they have uh, particular groups of genes like, uh, uh, that encode things like uh, lignin peroxidases um, uh, that are really adept at cracking open those aromatic, uh, those aromatic rings, which are very chemically stable. Um, and so that's why they're so good at breaking that down. Um, we've we have sort of a pilot project where we've tried to put some of those in the CERA We haven't gotten any of them to work, but, but you know, that would be one idea to try to get something out of the lignin. Um, there's uh, um, Tim Donahue's uh, lab and Dan Nagura's lab in GLBRC are actually uh, more focused directly on uh, uh, that line of research of can we get something valuable out of the lignin. Um, by using some kind of microbial engineering, um, either to try to process that. It turned out that lignin ring is actually very industrially valuable. So, you, um, so there's two strategies. You could you could try to you, you could try to take that aromatic ring and process it into something more valuable, or you could try to crack it open and detoxify it and use it as a fuel. And they've 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 looked at both of those those strategies, but um, it's it's not a trivial problem. Mark. So you gave some great examples about uh, hybrids that we use industrially or to make biofuels or what have you. But uh, do you have a sense from the sampling you've done in nature how often like this happens in the wild? Um, is this only a domesticated phenomenon or is this something you see throughout? Well, I don't know if this figure is actually going to help or not. But um, so, uh, so we see it a lot in the Saccharomyces. And there's a definite enrichment that strains coming from human-associated settings are more likely to be hybrid, whereas there's, I believe, one, count them, one interspecies hybrid that's been isolated from a setting that I would consider natural uh, in the Saccharomyces. Um, now, if we move out 
to the, <coughs> the whole subphylum, 500 million years of evolution, it turns out that you do find um, uh, a, there's another half a dozen known cases of interspecies hybrids. Every one of them is in a human associated setting. Now, um, there are about a dozen or a dozen and a half putative new cases on that tree alone uh, that we haven't looked at uh, closely enough to tell you what the, um, what the uh, source is. I think in some of the cases um, we've looked at and it's definitely human associated and in others it, it, it might not be. What I, what I can tell you is that those, are hap those events are happening at the tips of the trees, right? You know, if you look at the Saccharomyces here, they're very closely related, so it's happening among close relatives. Um, for those of you who, who are aficionados of, of whole genome duplications or allopolyploidization events in plants, um, there is one, count them, one whole genome duplication or allopolyploidization event that, that lasted, um, and it's about here 100 million years ago. And so the fact that we don't see a lot of widespread evidence for that says that probably hybrids are constantly forming and they're probably especially forming in uh, environments where humans have disturbed it and created really strong selective pressures, but they probably don't, in most cases, last uh, for a very long period of time. Yeah? Um, okay, so I have a related question. Um, you talked about species as opposed to strains, so <clears throat> do a lot of strains get formed that are stable enough to persist for a long period of time in a particular location, or are they always just mixing around and being in the same species? But yeah, so I mean, I mean, you've hit it on its head that if they're exchanging genes with other members of their species, then we would consider them, you know, all part of the same species. If they're not exchanging genes, if they're really genetically isolated, um, then, then we would consider them different species. In a lot of cases, we don't actually know enough, you know, to really apply rigorous criteria, and so we kind of apply back of the envelope criteria that, oh, if it's this different, it must, it must be a different species. It turns out that those back of the envelope criteria are conservative, and so if taxonomists, if, um, if a taxonomist following the rigorous criteria uh, has declared something a new species, it conservatively almost certainly is. If they've cut corners for one reason or another, then it's well, often not. So. They are to some extent. So, so in the so in Saccharomyces, people have actually looked and tried to estimate how often they're having sex versus how often they're just making copies of themselves, uh -huh. okay. and it's about once every thousand generations. Oh, okay. Um, and I, you know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I don't know whether that's a lot or a little. I mean, you know, we have um, uh, in order to for us to become multicellular, big multicellular organisms with dedicated gametes. Um, you know, we go through. Uh, I'm going to get this wrong, but uh, you know, four dozen cell divisions or something, right? So we're only having sex every 50 generations, uh, from a cellular perspective. So I don't know whether you know, but I think a thousand is you know is is more on the uh, extreme. There are also half of the species on this tree actually have no known sexual cycle. Doesn't mean that they're not having sex. Just mean we don't know about it yet. Um, we'll have to have to do some research. Yeah. There have been five like five mass extinctions. Uh, in any evidence of that in the, the, in the evolution of yeast and were they affected by it? Uh, well, so this is the part where I have to, oh yeah, th thank you Tom, I should, so, so the question is, um, there have been five mass extinctions uh, that <coughs> geologists have recorded by looking at fossils. Um, can we see evidence of that in the yeast, uh, yeast phylogeny? Um, so yeasts don't fossilize very well. <laughs> and, and if they did, you couldn't tell one yeast apart from another. Um, it turns out that even fungi don't uh, fossilize very well, and so it's actually really tricky to calibrate the fungal molecular, uh, molecular clocks in general. So this is the part where I have to be embarrassed to admit that that 500 million year number is probably kind of made up a little bit. It's, it's right within an order of magnitude, um, but uh, you know that's being calibrated by um, uh, fossils in other parts of the tree. And so the, you, know, you have to take it with kind of a grain of salt. Um, so I would, um, so I, would I would hesitate to try to lay geological time over where, we, it, where you would lay the mass extinctions. Um, al although people have 
people have sort of attempted to do. There is one point, you know, that would be sort of in the two to three hundred million years uh, where we actually see a lot of the family level diversity in yeast coming to being. So, you know, it's tempting. You could say, well, that's the Permian, right? And maybe that whole genome duplication is the KT boundary, but, you know, I think we, we would just be making up just so stories that kind of fit the data and we don't really have that much confidence of exactly, you know, how to, how to line those things up. Oh, you guys took too seriously. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're cutting into beer time. I forgot to say the three most important words in the Western civilization. I am buying. <laughs> <laughs>